Good evening to everybody. And I should confess that on one level, I'm very happy that we are going to have Andre giving this talk tonight. On the other, I'm very sad uh, because this is the first uh, geopolitical talk that we are not doing in person. Uh, and uh, knowing Andrei Kortunov, the speaker of tonight, uh, who is the director of the Russian Council on Foreign Affairs, and knowing the moment in which basically the relations between Russia and the EU, Russia and the West, Russia and Ukraine are so much discussed everywhere. Having not him physically is really a big miss. Uh, but this geopolitical talks is a major initiative of the uh, Institute for Human Sciences and the Austrian Ministry of Defense. Today, in early in the day, basically, Andre had been discussing some of the issues that we're going to discuss uh, uh, tonight with uh, uh, the chief of the general staff of uh, the Austrian army and some of the uh, senior Austrian officers. So now he's going to see slightly more civilian uh, public, <laughs> much more academic one. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, basically uh, telling the story, which you know, and you can read in his CV, what he has been studied, what he has been doing, um, I just want to make two points. I do believe that from time to time, we've never realized the importance of people like Andrei Kortonov, and I'm going to put also Fyodor Lukyanov and Dmitry Trenin for the way basically the Russia-West relations goes. Uh, because they have this very difficult uh, role to try to explain to the West what Russia is doing, even when they don't agree with this, to explain to the Russian leadership what the West is doing, not always, basically always when they don't necessarily agree with this, but as a result of it, basically to rationalize a type of relationship that is going uh, uh, very, uh, in a very difficult way. And uh, of course, on the Western side also, you had Fiona Hill and some others that successfully was performing this role. But in a crisis moment like this, I do believe that all of us that are going to have the opportunity to listen to Andre, and after that, you can uh, ask questions in the chat. This is a real privilege. And uh, Andre, please take the floor. We agree that he's going to speak for not more than 30 minutes. So then he's going to have a possibility to answer questions and we can have something that resembles a discuss discussion, nevertheless, that the Zoom discussions are not the same like a normal one. So, Andre. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Juan. It's uh, always a pleasure uh, to visit uh, Vienna, even uh, in such a, a remote uh, fashion. And uh, definitely, I'm glad that I have a chance to talk here. And uh, Ivan, uh, I will try not to repeat myself so that uh, you will not get bored after the first meeting that we had earlier today. Uh, so let me try to be a little bit uh, more academic and a little bit more detached. Uh, I was uh, trying to uh, answer uh, to a very simple question. Uh, what is the balance between continuity and change uh, in the Russian foreign policy in the times uh, of uh, COVID-19? And uh, my uh, general conclusion is uh, that uh, there is more continuity there than change. And the fundamentals uh, of the Russian foreign policy have not changed a lot uh, over the last uh, uh, two years. Uh, frankly, when the pandemic started, uh, I, uh, like many scholars uh, in my country and uh, also in Europe, uh, believed that uh, that uh, might be a game changer, that might uh, produce uh, something uh, very important uh, in the Russian foreign policy, in the policies of the European Union, arguably in the US policies and uh, the world will uh, stand up to the challenge of the pandemic and uh, probably some of the disagreements uh, could be put aside uh, and uh, we could uh, uh, get uh, into uh, quite uh, intense uh, cooperation uh, on uh, uh, fighting the uh, pandemic. Uh, as uh, we now can conclude, uh, that uh, did not happen. And uh, basically the competition continues. Uh, one can even argue that uh, the competition uh, has become uh, more fierce uh, than before the pandemic. We have uh, a vaccine war, we have an information war, we have a continuation of the uh, uh, diplomatic war. I think that all of us uh, know many manifestations of this confrontation. 
Uh, so this phenomenon has to be explained. Why this sh shock turned out not to be as powerful as to change the patterns of behavior. Uh, and I think that uh, you, are, you might be in a better position to make conclusions about uh, the West, about the European Union and the United States, but let me come up with some hypothesis uh, about uh, the Russian behavior. Why it has not changed, and why we have more of the same. Uh, the first explanation, which is, I think, rather trivial, is that uh, what we see in Russia is a lot of institutional inertia, that uh, even if uh, there is uh, an intention to change something, it is very difficult after so many years of confrontation, because uh, large institutions, large groups of people, many individuals uh, have vested interests in preserving status quo. Uh, status quo in domestic politics above all, but also in foreign policy. And of course, uh, if you look, for example, at the media outlets, uh, if you look at the propaganda machine, I think uh, it has accumulated a lot of inertia and it's very difficult uh, to change uh, its uh, operations. I recall, I think one you might also recall that at some point at one of the Valdai meetings, uh, Putin said, well, you should probably stop uh, uh, bad mouth in Ukraine, probably you should uh, change uh, your uh, attitude towards Ukraine and he appealed to the Russian media. Of course, nothing like that happened. And uh, uh, the uh, format of uh, uh, presentations and operations of the Russian media, media continue. Uh, but uh, I think that this explanation is not really good enough that we should think uh, about uh, something different. Uh, yet another uh, explanation that I might think of is that probably when the pandemic started, there was a perception on the Russian side that uh, it would manage the pandemic better than the West. And uh, if you remember the early stages of the pandemic, indeed, uh, uh, the rates of uh, infections in Russia were lower than in Europe. Uh, the mortality rates were also lower uh, in the Russia arguably was the first country to come up with a vaccine. Uh, so there was a degree of uh, uh, optimism, if not triumphalism, about how Russia can manage the pandemic. And I do recall talking to Chinese. Uh, at that point, uh, many scholars in Chinese believed that uh, Russia and China were really leading in fighting the pandemic. Uh, now, two years later, I think it's clear that Russia is much closer to European nations than to East Asian nations in uh, uh, how it handles uh, the, or how it mishandles uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, but I think that the inertia of this triumphalism is still with us. Uh, and uh, I think from time to time, our state leaders argue that uh, uh, Russia is doing much better, and if it uh, uh, does better, uh, if uh, it comes out of the pandemic stronger and uh, its adversaries come out of the pandemic weaker, well, why, why don't we wait? Why don't we wait if time is playing on our side? Uh, yet uh, another explanation, which I think we can consider, is that simply the style of the Russian leadership uh, is not conducive. Uh, to concessions and uh, unilateral actions. Uh, these unilateral actions and concessions are perceived as weaknesses. And uh, whatever our leaders do, uh, they uh, ask for reciprocity uh, and uh, they cannot uh, recognize that they did anything wrong. Reflection. Uh, uh, there is no reflection on the past uh, uh, there is uh, no confession that something uh, was done not the way it should have. Uh, so I think that partially explains <clears throat> why there was no uh, pandemic ceasefire and why we continue uh, to uh, pursue the policies that we started long before the pandemic. <laughs> However, Having said that, I don't want to imply that there were no changes <coughs> in the Russian foreign policy. Of course, there were changes, and let me identify a couple of them. First of all, I think today uh, the 
political priorities of the Russian leadership uh, uh, have uh, moved even further in the direction of the domestic agenda. Uh, the pandemic was a catalyst which uh, accelerated the shift from the foreign policy priorities uh, to uh, domestic priorities. Uh, as you probably know, we had uh, elections to the State Duma uh, uh, and, uh, in, in fall, and uh, I think the elections uh, demonstrated uh, the limitations uh, of uh, the authorities uh, to manage the political process inside the country. Uh, the, the Russian leadership mobilized all the resources it had at its disposal uh, to win the election. Uh, it mobilized all the public figures it could uh, reach out to, including such popular figures as uh, Minister Lavrov and uh, Minister Shoigu and a couple of others. And still the United Russia Party uh, has not managed to uh, get uh, a significant majority in the state group. Uh, it was a very important signal that uh, the power base uh, might be eroded, maybe slowly, but steadily. And if you put you will also see a gradual decline. Nothing catastrophic, uh, nothing that uh, would uh, be uh, uh, a reason to get concerned today, but tomorrow. So the priorities have shifted in the direction of the domestic agenda, more sensitive to what the Russian leadership perceives as uh, foreign interference into the Russian domestic affairs. So the odds are that we will see new foreign agents uh, and uh, new undesirable organizations. Uh, the last uh, case, uh, which uh, got a lot of public attention is this uh, uh, demand uh, from the office of the prosecutor general uh, to close uh, Memorial Society, which is one of the leading uh, 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 human rights uh, defending organizations uh, uh, and uh, uh, organizations uh, which deals with education as a step, which suggests that uh, the level of sensitivity uh, towards uh, uh, the alleged foreign interference uh, is uh, growing. Uh, uh, it also means uh, that the Russian foreign policy is likely uh, to be a low budget foreign policy. And we've seen already some shifts uh, even before uh, the pandemic. If you compare the two Russian uh, engagements uh, in uh, the MENA region, uh, the Syrian model and uh, later on the Libyan model, uh, you will see a very clear difference between the two. Uh, Syria is about uh, geopolitics. Uh, Syria is poor, and uh, Russia can hardly get any economic returns on its investments in Syria. Uh, Libya is rich, and uh, Libya is uh, about economic benefits, it's about oil, it's about uh, transportation infrastructure, it's about which can uh, bring lucrative returns. Uh, second, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Syria, we have a, a kind of explicit uh, uh, heavy engagement uh, managed by the Minister of Defense. In Libya, we have uh, mostly private military companies, uh, clearly low cost, uh, and uh, which uh, uh, Russia can always uh, distance itself from which uh, Russia is doing, saying that basically, you know, we don't have even the legislation on private military companies. These people are hired by someone else, maybe in Hong Kong or elsewhere, and we can take no responsibility for what they're doing. So it's a different type of engagement, which suggests that uh, Russia is moving in the direction of uh, uh, low budget and uh, low risk uh, uh, foreign policy activism. Uh, of course, uh, you can uh, find other manifestations of the same trend. I do remember that uh, a year ago, there were speculations that uh, Russia will uh, uh, generate a, a golden rain over Belarus in order to absorb this country and uh, in order to link Lukashenko to Moscow uh, 
uh, in, in a very uh, clear and unambiguous way. But uh, actually the credit line to Belarus was rather modest. It was $1.5 billion. And uh, as you can see, uh, there is no rush in integration. Uh, there are many uh, projects, but uh, projects are rather conservative and incremental. Uh, no desire to invest a lot uh, into Belarus. Uh, likewise, you know, I would say that uh, the Russian engagement in South Caucasus was uh, relatively low-key investment and maybe a delayed investment. Uh, so uh, there is a clear in intention to save money uh, and uh, uh, to uh, pursue uh, economic interests uh, of uh, large companies abroad rather than to uh, uh, spend funding on uh, some uh, uh, political advantage, uh, ad, uh, political adventures uh, with uh, uh, high risks and uh, low economic returns. So these uh, financial considerations are likely to continue influencing the Russian foreign policy. I would uh, also say uh, that uh, uh, about its abilities to control the post-Soviet space. And that uh, has been manifested uh, during the pandemics. Uh, Russia accepted the Turkish presence in the South Caucasus, uh, if not welcomed uh, this presence. Russia accepted, if not welcomed, uh, the Chinese presence uh, uh, in Central Asia, and this presence might grow in future. Uh, there are rumors that China is negotiating uh, a security agreement with uh, Tajikistan, which of course uh, set a, an important precedent for the region, uh, provided uh, that this is not the Western uh, influence. Uh, I think Moscow is uh, uh, ready to accept some kind of engagement of other uh, major powers on the territory of the former Soviet Union. Uh, this is clearly a new phenomenon and uh, this is uh, something uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, now, of course, uh, there are red lines, and I think that one of the red lines is NATO. Uh, we uh, saw a new cycle of uh, escalation between Russia and NATO, uh, which resulted uh, in the closure of the Russian office in uh, Brussels, and the closure of uh, military, of uh, NATO, representative offices and information offices in Moscow. I think it's also very indicative that Russia lost patience with NATO and uh, uh, definitely it would like uh, now to take a pause, maybe to wait uh, till uh, the next NATO summit to see uh, a new NATO doctrine to be discussed and approved. And uh, after that, uh, we might get back uh, to a new uh, chapter in relations between Russia and NATO. Maybe there'll be something like a, a Russian NATO ad hoc crisis management group uh, uh, outside uh, of the framework of the NATO Russia Council. Still, uh, I think uh, Russia expects NATO to honor the uh, Founding Act, and uh, it is ready to honor the Founding Act from its side, uh, which suggests that uh, uh, some contacts between Russia and NATO are anticipated uh, uh, in the future. Uh, I would also say that, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, there was a, a change of uh, attitudes uh, towards the United States and to the European Union, respectively. Uh, a year ago, the general sentiment in Moscow was that uh, uh, if you make a comparison between uh, the European Union, the United States, uh, Europe uh, was the good cops, uh, the good cop uh, in this uh, duo, and the United States was perceived as the bad cop. Uh, now it is not no longer the case. Uh, I think that uh, after the meeting between Putin and uh, Biden, uh, there is uh, a kind of uh, a softer approach to the, towards the United States. The United States uh, was not severely criticized uh, during the uh, unorganized uh, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a very clear and explicit disappointment uh, uh, with the European Union uh, and uh, with the uh, major Russia, Russian partners uh, in Europe. 
uh, and uh, one of the manifestations of this, this disappointment is the publication of the exchange of letters between Minister Lavrov uh, and uh, his peers in France and in Germany, uh, which suggests that uh, Russia really lost hope uh, to uh, achieve anything significant within the uh, Normandy format. And uh, there are no expectations that uh, uh, European uh, uh, participants to the Normandy format uh, are likely to uh, uh, enforce uh, uh, the Minsk agreements uh, on uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian France. So I think that uh, uh, there is uh, less hope in Europe. Uh, there is more hope uh, with the United States, though, of course, uh, it's an uphill battle with the United States as well. Uh, we see new sanctions coming from Washington literally every week or almost every week. Uh, on top of that, uh, the war between embassies continues. Uh, and uh, we still don't have a U.S. consulate in Moscow and Russia at large. Uh, our American friends suggest that uh, Russians should go to Warsaw uh, to get U.S. visas, uh, which, uh, of course, a kind of irony. Uh, and uh, on top of that, uh, I think that uh, the two sides have very different perceptions on how they should uh, proceed uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, future arms control. Uh, because the U.S. perception is that uh, the two sides uh, should uh, focus uh, on nuclear systems, both strategic and non-strategic, while the Russian position is that uh, uh, we should focus uh, primarily on strategic weapons, both nuclear and non-nuclear. And as you can see, it's very different, two very different approaches, uh, very hard to reconcile. Uh, plus, uh, we have uh, uh, very serious problems of verification. I don't think that they can be resolved easily. Uh, there are issues of uh, new technologies uh, in arms race. And uh, of course, uh, space is a challenge, but uh, cyber is also a challenge. Uh, prompt strike uh, is uh, very difficult to conceptualize. Uh, autonomous uh, lethal systems, uh, drones, uh, are also a riddle. Uh, so, uh, when they say that we still have four years uh, before uh, start, uh, the new start agreement expires, I don't think it's a lot of time. And of course, the issue of multilateralization of arms control remains a stumbling block. Uh, the United States would like Russia to uh, bring China to the table. Russia would say that uh, uh, the United States uh, should engage its allies, especially now when the United Kingdom has already declared that it is going to increase its nuclear arsenal. Uh, so I don't uh, expect any easy solutions uh, on uh, uh, arms control uh, in general. Uh, but at least, you know, we share strategic culture. At least we can talk to Americans. Uh, at least uh, uh, there might be some progress uh, on, uh, uh, on a number of issues. Uh, now, I do believe uh, that uh, Russia is ready to compromise on a number of regional problems. Maybe uh, the most uh, graphic uh, indicator was uh, <clears throat> the extension of the uh, 2020 UN Security Council resolution on the humanitarian assistance uh, corridors in Syria, which allowed to avoid uh, uh, humanitarian disaster in Idlib. Uh, I don't exclude some kind uh, of uh, uh, deals uh, in the Northeast and in the South of Syria. Uh, of course, uh, there are still major disagreements about the future of the country, uh, but I think that uh, the, in Syria, uh, a number of issues can be managed. I can also imagine that um, uh, there can be some kind of uh, understanding on Afghanistan, and uh, I had a meeting with the EU a special envoy to Afghanistan who visited Moscow. Uh, the, United, the European Union remains the major contributor in terms of the humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, Russia doesn't have such deep pockets as Europe, so it will be forced uh, to, the, to get to the table with the European Union. I think Russia would like. Uh, to engage the European Union together with China and Pakistan uh, into discussing uh, 
Afghanistan and hopefully to come to a common denominator uh, on issues uh, related uh, to the recognition of uh, the uh, new Afghan leadership. Uh, finally, just a couple of words, as I understand my time is running out, a couple of words on, on China. Uh, of course, uh, the Russian-Chinese cooperation will continue. I think that uh, uh, it uh, will get further consolidated in the military technical field. Uh, we are moving uh, from arms trade uh, to joint uh, R&D programs, uh, which is important for both countries. Russia still has certain technological invent advantages in a number of areas where China is interested in this cooperation. I can also uh, foresee uh, more uh, joint efforts uh, uh, at the level of diplomacy, uh, but at the same time, I think there are growing concerns about overdependence uh, on China, and uh, there are attempts to balance China. Uh, so far, these attempts were not too successful. Russia failed uh, in trying to get a reconciliation with Japan. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, we have a lot of opportunities with India, although Putin is uh, going to India uh, next month uh, and uh, uh, allegedly he will sign a couple of large scale uh, agreements with uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, and uh, uh, there were a couple of private uh, contracts uh, signed as well. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the situation. Uh, uh, at, at this juncture, uh, I uh, do not foresee uh, any dramatic changes uh, in the Russian foreign policy uh, in the near future. I think uh, it will continue uh, to be mostly reactive. It will react uh, to impulses coming from abroad. Uh, definitely, Russia is not likely uh, to withdraw. Uh, from uh, Syria or Ukraine. I don't think it will happen, but I cannot imagine another Syria or uh, Ukraine uh, to emerge anytime soon. I think that uh, Russia has entered a period of uh, consolidating its foreign policy uh, gains. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, my take uh, is that uh, we might see even some manifestations of uh, neo-isolationism in the Russian foreign policy, which does not uh, exclude uh, uh, cooperation in select areas, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, Green Deal with the European Union, uh, or uh, issues uh, like uh, non-proliferation. I think Russia can become a little bit uh, more active uh, on uh, uh, issues uh, uh, related to non-proliferation, especially if uh, GSOP, the multilateral nuclear deal with Iran is rescued, uh, then uh, it might move uh, to the concept of more for more, which is advocated by the Biden administration. I uh, also uh, believe that uh, Russia might uh, uh, try to explore opportunities in remote parts of the world. Uh, uh, it is definitely becoming more active in Africa and partially in uh, Latin America. Uh, so let me stop here. I think that uh, I spoke for almost half an hour and uh, I would be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. And I'm strongly encouraging everybody who have a question to ask to do it in the chat and I'm going to read it. Uh, I'm going to use the opportunity of moderating you to basically to ask three questions at the same time. So no need to come to you for a second, uh, for the second round. and. My first impression is I very much agree with you that in a strange way, Russia is turning back like everybody as a result of the COVID. Uh, but what struck me in talking about academic uh, publications, one of the most interesting academic publications coming from during the COVID period was the historical essay, which President Putin published in July. And this was basically the story of uh, Ukraine and Russia being the same people. But what struck me particularly was this kind of, and I listened to this also during the last Valdai, very much thinking in population terms. Uh, this was very much using the word like passionanos coming from Gomilyov, all this idea of basically thinking in terms of 
what is going to happen to certain type of a, uh, Russian ethnos and so on. And I'm saying this because in my view, this is interesting and this makes uh, probably Kremlin's relations to both Belarus and Ukraine totally different than the type of policies that you're going to have towards other parts of the post-Soviet space. To what extent the consolidation is just consolidation of the regime uh, in the terms of basically existing borders, existing kind of a population, or to what extent basically Russia believed that there is a certain civilizational space. And if Russia is not going to consolidate the, this kind of a Russia world as a whole, this is not going to be competitive in a, uh, in a big uh, uh, story. And from here come my second question. As you know, there is a lot of talk now uh, in the Western media about uh, the high risk of a kind of a military uh, uh, developments in uh, Ukraine. And I don't believe that any of us can predict and I don't want to push you in a situation to say, is it uh, uh, likely or dislikely? But my idea is what is the type of analysis that can make such a position possible and what kind of analysis is going to make it impossible? So I'm much more interested to think about the assumptions than about judgment, is it going something to happen or not? Uh, because from time to time, I had the feeling that uh, we're not great at distinguish between the noise and uh, the signal. And uh, uh, from this point of view, everything happening around European borders. And the third part of my question is exactly what you said about Europe. It was quite clear for every one of us who was in Moscow recently is that uh, there was a very dismissive view about European Union. And I can understand that some of the sources of it. But my feeling is that there was a sense that the positive agenda with the EU is not positive anymore, because if I'm going to use the Russian word, uh, Europe is uh, basically you cannot achieve anything with Europe because everything is so difficult, Europe is so complicated. And even when the United States was much more present in Europe, it was easier to achieve something. But now Europe is neither independent nor very much on the Americans. So as a result of it basically becomes a partner that it cannot deliver. First, to what extent you believe that this is there? And secondly, to what extent do you believe it is a right or wrong assessment uh, of the possibilities of the European Union? I'm asking this because for me, at least it's very interesting to try for the European Union to try to see how we are seen from outside. Because from time to time, we believe that people outside see us in the way we want to be seen. Uh, and this kind of a three questions are the one. Mm. <laughs> that no. th thank you. These are, these are good questions, of course. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, I uh, do agree with you that uh, it seems that uh, President Putin has a very special uh, attitude towards Ukraine. Uh, and I think that the general perception uh, that uh, they have in the Kremlin is that indeed uh, Ukrainians are nice people, they are like us. Uh, there is no major difference between Russians and Ukrainians, but somehow uh, they uh, got uh, under this sinister spell, uh, which was uh, imported to Ukraine maybe by uh, these radical nationalists uh, in uh, uh, in the western part of the country. Uh, maybe it was a trick uh, by the West, uh, <laughs> the kind of CIA or George Soros conspiracy, you know, you, you name it. But uh, it just happened uh, that uh, Ukrainians uh, got, uh, mm, uh, got under this uh, uh, bad spell and uh, uh, what you have to do is uh, uh, to bring them back to reality uh, because uh, they are on the illusion that uh, they uh, can be assisted by the West uh, and uh, they will be used and abused and uh, nothing good will happen to them uh, on this path. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is something that uh, President Putin and uh, people around him, like, you know, Medvedev, for example, he also wrote a piece on Ukraine. Uh, they, they really believe, they believe that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, no borderline and there is no uh, difference in political culture between Russia and Ukraine. And this is exactly why they might be so concerned uh, about uh, Ukraine drifting away from Russia because they see that uh, the political culture is changing. Uh, that uh, the uh, the Russian language uh, is losing its positions uh, in Ukraine, 
uh, that uh, uh, there's a new generation of Ukrainians uh, coming to the four people who never lived in the Soviet Union and who do not uh, think that they share a lot uh, with the Russian Federation. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, makes the Russian leadership nervous uh, that uh, it might uh, turn out uh, that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, is uh, 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 is uh, moving away from Russia, and it's not clear how this movement can be stopped. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know to what extent a military action uh, might be regarded as a mechanism to stop this movement. Frankly, I don't think uh, uh, it will happen. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, any uh, military action is likely to consolidate uh, the Ukrainian nation and to cement uh, anti-Russian sentiments that uh, exist uh, in this uh, nation. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's clearly now more than uh, Donbass only. Uh, and uh, I do recall that uh, a couple of years before uh, 2014, uh, there were statements, I don't know whether Putin made them or you know, some of his associates that basically in order to be a full-fledged center of power uh, in the world, uh, you need to have a population of at least 300 million. Uh, better to have 500 million, but at least 300 million, uh, which implied that uh, Russia could uh, uh, become great again only if uh, uh, it is in a position to consolidate all or practically all of the uh, post-Soviet space around itself. Uh, and of course, uh, Ukraine uh, remains uh, uh, one of the largest chunks of these uh, post-Soviets uh, definitely lose their last and their appeal. Uh, so, uh, I don't know to what extent uh, you know these perceptions might uh, influence uh, a specific foreign policy decisions, uh, but uh, these perceptions uh, do exist and they're reflected in some documents and in the articles of Mr. Putin, Mr. Medvedev, uh, and uh, other leaders uh, of the country. Uh, so that uh, makes uh, me feel concerned because I think that the only way Russia can fix, quote unquote, fix relations with Ukraine uh, is by taking it uh, as a foreign country like Romania or Bulgaria, uh, a country which uh, might be quite fragile and uh, might be not very efficient at this juncture, but still it's a foreign country and uh, you cannot consider Ukraine to be a part of your domestic uh, political agenda. Uh, now, let me say that uh, mm, uh, on the yeah on the on the European Union, I think it's a very good question, and we discussed it many times. I think one of the problems between Russia and the European Union is that both sides are convinced that the other side uh, is declining, and that it is declining at a rather uh, fast uh, uh, speed. Uh, I think in Russia, they clearly underestimate the resilience of the European Union uh, and the attractiveness of the European project. Uh, even today, with all the problems notwithstanding, uh, uh, Europe remains the major magnet of attraction for, uh, for the Russian society. It's not China, it's not uh, Iran, uh, it's not Syria or Venezuela, it is the European Union where young Russians want uh, to study, where they would like to get employed, uh, uh, where they would like to spend their vacations, uh, and uh, that uh, should not be underestimated. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, there were disappointments about uh, the inability of the European Union uh, to uh, deliver on its uh, real or perceived commitments. And uh, it is very indicative uh, that uh, Putin, uh, when he was asked uh, about Erdogan, he said, well, you know, Erdogan is a reliable, a reliable partner. Uh, he defends his interests uh, and uh, we disagree on many issues, but I understand how to work with him and uh, he's trustworthy. He's uh, he's the uh, and uh, uh, basically we will continue working with him, though uh, it is not always easy uh, to find uh, an accommodation with uh, Turkey. 
but with the European Union, I think uh, his perception is that uh, it's a very weak corporate actor, uh, and uh, uh, it, the, the European Union avoids uh, any decisions uh, that uh, might uh, jeopardize this uh, very fragile consensus uh, that uh, the European Union has. Uh, that's why the European Union has never moved uh, uh, beyond the five Federica Mogherini principles. There has been uh, no attempt uh, to come up with a real strategy towards Russia. And of course, uh, Putin should be irritated with all the uncertainties and uh, procrastinations uh, uh, related uh, to the uh, to, to Nord Stream 2 project uh, uh, and uh, uh, to this uh, uh, potential EU-Russia summit, uh, which was proposed by Macron and uh, Merkel, and later on it was overruled by other members of the European Union. I think that uh, uh, the European Union, <laughs> I hate to say that, but uh, probably it is the complexity of the European Union uh, which uh, 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 is a, a challenge for Russia. Russia has, in my view, and I think that our ambassador to Brussels, Vladimir Chizhov, would definitely disagree with that, but I think that Russia has never really mastered uh, uh, an ability to uh, interact uh, with such a complex, uh, such uh, uh, comprehensive structure as the European Union. Uh, it has never managed uh, to infiltrate uh, European Union uh, institutions, uh, uh, and uh, now we have a price for that. Uh, that's why Lavrov says that probably we can terminate our relations with the European Union completely, and we uh, should uh, work uh, with the individual member states, but we all understand that it is not possible that you cannot have great relations with Berlin and no relations with Brussels. You, you, you've got to uh, to work with Brussels as well. Uh, so uh, I don't want to sound too pessimistic. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look uh, at the uh, energy transit agenda, uh, I think that Russia uh, has clearly changed uh, its approach uh, to energy issues. And there is a learning curve uh, in the Russian leadership, maybe not uh, too steep uh, learning curve, but still. I think uh, there are some prospects uh, for cooperation between Russia and the European Union uh, in this area. And as I have already mentioned, uh, there are some points uh, on which Russia and uh, Europe uh, can agree uh, on, on regional matters. So uh, I don't think that we, we should uh, be a, uh, too pessimistic about this relationship, but definitely uh, no breakthrough uh, is uh, looming on the horizon. I think uh, we will have more or less business as usual. Well, usual after 2014, uh, if uh, there is no war uh, in Ukraine. If there is a war in Ukraine, definitely it will be a game changer. Thank you, Andre. And we have two questions. One is from the acting rector of uh, our institute, Ivan Vevuda, whom you know very well. No, uh, yeah, sure. Ivan is asking uh, for you to comment on the Russian Moldova relations and basically the gas issue and the recent meeting between Lavrov and uh, 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 Nico Popesco. And then there is a very quote of important and straight questions coming from uh, Paul Mikhailovich, who said, uh, if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, I want to excuse. He said, so Putin will never leave Ukraine alone. Will never stop interfering. Uh, so on one level, you have basically Moldova issue, but on this, and this is in my view, really important questions, to what extent the current Russian leadership, not Russia, is really ready to perceive that Ukraine is an independent country and sovereign country, even if it is going to be an anti-Russian. Well, uh, let me start then with the second question, since you emphasized it. Uh... Uh, I, I do recall uh, Putin uh, speaking at uh, one of the meetings of St. Petersburg uh, Investment Forum, uh, and he was asked about sovereignty. And uh, his answer was very indicative. He said, you know, there are only a bunch of countries in the world that enjoy sovereignty, full sovereignty. 
uh, he said, well, Russia has this sovereignty, uh, China has sovereignty, uh, India has sovereignty, and uh, there are some others, but not too many. Uh, so I think that uh, his uh, vision of sovereignty is uh, uh, somewhat uh, limited uh, to uh, great powers. And I think that uh, his uh, assumption is that uh, uh, smaller nations have to adjust, uh, have to keep in mind the geopolitical environment and interests of their larger neighbors. So if you take Ukraine, uh, I think that uh, uh, Russia under Vladimir Putin might be ready not to interfere uh, into domestic affairs uh, into the Ukrainian state, provided that uh, Ukraine does not cross certain red lines. And uh, the most uh, explicit red line is, of course, uh, its cooperation with NATO. And I would say that it's not just uh, joining NATO formally, but allowing NATO to uh, uh, somehow uh, develop its military infrastructure on the U Ukrainian territory. I think that right now, the Russian leadership is concerned uh, not about uh, Article 5, because the perception is that uh, Ukraine will not get uh, to this level anytime soon, uh, but uh, about uh, Ukraine uh, turning into an unsinkable uh, aircraft carrier of the United States uh, parked uh, uh, at the Russian border. I think this is the concern, uh, that uh, Ukraine will be hostile, and uh, the United States uh, will beef uh, Ukraine uh, with uh, uh, new arms, and uh, uh, Russia will have uh, this uh, existential problem. Uh, so uh, just getting back to the question, I think that uh, under certain circumstances, uh, uh, Putin would probably refrain from interference into Ukrainian affairs. Like, for example, arguably he doesn't interfere uh, into internal affairs of Kazakhstan. Uh, what uh, they do in Kazakhstan, it's up to them. And uh, the Russian leadership has always been very cautious not uh, to raise, um, well, with some exceptions, but mostly not to raise uh, territorial issues with Kazakhstan uh, because uh, Kazakhstan does not challenge us strategically. Uh, and uh, because uh, definitely uh, Kazakhstan is not likely to host uh, 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 foreign military bases on its territory. So I think that if you put yourself into Putin's shoes, uh, the answer is that uh, we will not interfere into Ukrainian affairs, uh, provided that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, takes into account our legitimate interests. So that's, that's, and of course, the definition of legitimate interests, uh, uh, you know, uh, is something that uh, we uh, can uh, discuss uh, and uh, probably uh, uh, we, uh, we can question. Uh, in terms of Moldova, uh, I think that uh, there is a, a degree of Moldova fatigue in Russia. Uh, and uh, there was an appointment uh, in Igor Dadon, who claimed to be a pro-Russian president, but in reality did not deliver too much. And uh, uh, I think that's why Ru the Russian leadership took uh, what I would call a hands-off approach uh, to uh, elections in Moldova, to both elections in Moldova. And uh, there were no attempts to mobilize the Moldovan diaspora in Russia. Uh, unlike uh, they were able to mobilize the Moldovan diaspora in Europe. And if you look at uh, how people voted and also the, uh, the turnout, you'll see that uh, Russian Moldovans, quote unquote, were much more passive than uh, those Moldovans uh, who uh, reside uh, in European countries. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, there was an idea that we should uh, become more pragmatic. Uh, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, that was exactly the message uh, that uh, basically we don't uh, want uh, to uh, spend too much time and energy uh, on, on this uh, issue. Uh, we hope 
that uh, Moldova uh, will not uh, start a process of uh, fast reunification with Romania, uh, that uh, interests of Transnistria will be taken into consideration. Russia uh, has uh, rather extensive economic relations with uh, Transnistria, which it doesn't want to lose. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, since you are moving to Europe, uh, uh, we should renegotiate uh, our gas prices to you because uh, uh, we can no longer subsidize uh, the Moldovan economy, which is moving west rather than east. Uh, and uh, allegedly, they were able to cut a deal. Uh, it is still not clear whether this deal stays or not. Uh, uh, Gazprom maintains that uh, Moldova so far uh, has not paid uh, for the debts that uh, uh, it has already accumulated. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that uh, there is uh, no much anxiety about Moldova. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, Russia is uh, learning uh, how to uh, leave uh, being a minority stakeholder, shareholder in certain situations, because clear enough, uh, Moldova is gravitating uh, uh, towards the European Union. And uh, I think it will continue to gravitate towards the European Union in the foreseeable future. Andre, thank you very much. And there is the last question that I want to ask you. And this is the question from Pavel Barkovsky uh, from Belarus, who basically is citing a recent statement of view that the new big war can just start out of thoughtlessness. And he is asking the question, how basically you view the migration crisis on the Belarusian border? Does this is a character of a hybrid attack on the European Union? And from this point of view, could be this kind of a small regional conflict that can cause a new big war? Well, you know, we discussed uh, this issue earlier today, Ivan, so I'm sorry that I'll have to repeat myself, but... Uh... I always ask myself uh, a question about uh, the degree of autonomy that Alexander Lukashenko enjoys uh, in dealing with Moscow. And of course, uh, many analysts uh, in the West, but also in Russia, uh, argue that uh, Lukashenko is uh, just an operator, that he is uh, the executor of the plan which uh, has been designed uh, uh, in Russia, in the Kremlin, and that. Uh, Putin stands uh, behind Lukashenko and uh, he pulls the strings. I, I have to say that I'm not sure that I share this view because in my opinion, the ultimate goal of Alexander Lukashenko is uh, to uh, somehow force the European Union uh, into a dialogue and uh, to get uh, at least uh, some kind of legitimacy and some kind of recognition in the European Union. Uh, if not formal, at least uh, de facto recognition as uh, uh, the leader of this country, as a person who is in charge and a person whom you should deal with if you want to resolve problems on the Russian, on the Belarusian Polish border. And uh, the reason why he needs this legitimacy in the European Union is that uh, he wants to increase uh, the. Uh, area of maneuvering vis-a-vis -vis Moscow. Uh, he is uh, too dependent on Moscow right now. Uh, he cannot continue pursuing his uh, multi-vector foreign policy that would balance Moscow and Brussels. And uh, he becomes a hostage uh, to the Kremlin. That's not a very comfortable position for him. So he wants to get uh, recognition in Europe in order to make uh, this leash uh, on which uh, uh, the Russian leadership keeps him uh, a little bit longer. So then if it is the case, if uh, this hypothesis is right, uh, then the question is whether Putin should support Lukashenko uh, in his effort. And in my opinion, uh, it's not really in the interest of the Russian leadership uh, to allow Lukashenko get uh, uh, Lukashenko getting back uh, to his uh, multi-vector foreign policy. Uh, and uh, that would definitely uh, make uh, Lukashenko even less predictable and even less manageable. Uh, so uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, Lukashenko does not need an incentive uh, from the Kremlin to do what he is doing on the border with the Poland. Uh, 
uh, I think that it is his own initiatives. Uh, and what I can say is that uh, probably uh, the Russian leadership tolerates that because uh, it doesn't believe that it can work, uh, that uh, uh, the European Union will be forced to start a new dialogue with Minsk. Uh, if, if you follow the recent developments, uh, even Poland argued that uh, they were ready to talk to Moscow, but not to Minsk. So, so far, Lukashenko is not very successful uh, in meeting his goals. Uh, he uh, states that uh, allegedly Angela Merkel uh, uh, spoke to him, uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, he will ever be recognized uh, by the European Union as uh, legitimate president uh, of Belarus. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, that uh, uh, this crisis uh, uh, might be losing steam already. Uh, I do not uh, foresee uh, any further escalation. I think it would be difficult uh, to even manage such an escalation. But uh, I uh, would like to uh, get back to my uh, uh, idea which you referred to is that uh, a war can start uh, uh, out of uh, uh, out of uh, uh, miscalculation or even sheer stupidity. Uh, if you uh, break all the contacts uh, between uh, two adversarial sides, and these contacts are broken right now, uh, if you have no mill to mill if you have uh, no confidence building measures, uh, if you moved out of the open skies treaty, uh, if uh, there are no uh, regulations of the arms race, uh, then you tend uh, to get down to the worst case scenario in uh, uh, assessing the intentions and the actions of your adversary. And this uh, worst case scenario might uh, trigger what we call an inadvertent escalation. I think that uh, and I, I, the, my take is that the real danger comes uh, not so much uh, from the Polish Belarusian border, though of course it is also an explosive uh, area, but uh, I would single out uh, the Black Sea uh, as uh, arguably uh, the most uh, uh, dangerous uh, 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 sub-region uh, where Russia and NATO collide. And uh, the incident uh, with, uh, with Defender, with the British ship uh, in summer, I think was a very dangerous uh, incident uh, because we have a very high level of military activities of various countries uh, in the Black Sea region. Uh, we don't have any agreements, even modest agreements that we have uh, in uh, the Baltic Sea area. Uh, and plus, of course, uh, we have territorial disputes, uh, which uh, uh, make it even more difficult uh, to uh, come up with some kind of accommodation. Uh, the United Kingdom wanted uh, to support the Ukrainian cause. Uh, they do not recognize uh, uh, the Russian territorial waters around Crimea. Uh, Russia insists uh, of uh, it's right uh, to set uh, certain limits uh, on the passage of uh, foreign ships. And uh, here we can come uh, to a uh, defender where uh, major US uh, military vessels uh, have a lot of gun power and uh, you can still sink them. Uh, but uh, that might trigger uh, a real conflict, uh, I think that uh, it would be difficult to stop it once uh, it is launched. So uh, in my opinion, uh, the first thing that we should do is to restore some kind of uh, mill to mill contacts uh, in any format which uh, the two sides uh, consider appropriate uh, and to start working on de-escalation assuming that uh, the name of the game is not to move away from uh, a confrontation to cooperation. Unfortunately, it will not happen anytime soon, but the name of the risks associated with this confrontation and hopefully to reduce the costs uh, of this confrontation. And this is doable, I think, that both sides uh, uh, can uh, probably agree 
to some like ambiguity is not a part of the approach. Uh, if uh, uh, either side uh, pursues the approach uh, of strategic ambiguity, then we have a problem because we will see attempts to escalate in order to de-escalate and uh, it is plain with fire. Andre, thank you so much. When you had been talking about the war by accident and thoughtlessness, uh, Ivan Weber would just ask a very quick question and this and being, uh, you have your lecture in IWM. So I don't see a best way to finish them having him asking you the last question. So the question is, what about uh, Vucic uh, Putin meeting? Do you believe that we can also expect some kind of a small conflicts around the Balkans? To what extent this destabilization on the European Union borders is going to be spread? Well, you know, as, as we discussed already, uh, in the uh, Western Balkans, Russia can be uh, either uh, a stakeholder or a spoiler. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it doesn't have a lot of cards. Uh, clearly, it's not a full stack uh, which it can play with. Uh, so uh, we see, uh, I think that uh, they, many in Moscow believe that Russia is losing ground uh, in uh, Western Balkans. Uh, and uh, it has uh, to change uh, the rules of the game if it, want, if it wants uh, to regain the ground. And uh, that might partially explain the current uh, Russian attitude uh, uh, to what's going on uh, in Bosnia. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, Russia is likely to follow the Serbian position. And uh, I, I think that uh, Vucic uh, is uh, is a very clever politician, if I might put it in such a way, and uh, he will not uh, cross red lines uh, with the European Union, and uh, he will not uh, seek a support from Moscow if he feels that this support might uh, jeopardize uh, his chances of getting closer uh, to the European Union. Uh, in my humble opinion, uh, Western Balkans uh, will be sooner or later absorbed by the European Union, it's a natural process of the gradual EU extension. These are relatively small countries. Uh, it's not Ukraine, it's not Turkey. Uh, it would be very difficult to digest uh, any of the two big uh, uh, peripheral European countries. But uh, I think that probably I will live long enough uh, to see <laughs> even Serbia uh, within the European Union. And of course, uh, the trick here uh, is how to change uh, this uh, uh, zero-sum mentality, which exists uh, partially in Moscow, but it also exists uh, in some European capitals, that uh, whatever Russia gains is a net loss for the European Union and the other way around. I think that uh, this is really not the case. Uh, I would even say that uh, the Chinese engagement is not necessarily detrimental to the interests of the European Union, but that's a different story. And I think that the, Russia, the, the, the China role is much more difficult to fix than the Russian role. Uh, but uh, definitely Western Balkans, uh, uh, it is not Ukraine. There is no such sensitivity. You know, Russia never claimed uh, any special rights uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding the Western Balkans. I, I do recall that at some point uh, uh, then uh, President uh, Milosevic uh, suggested that uh, Yugoslavia should join the Union state between Russia and Belarus. And of course, uh, there were people in Moscow who got very enthusiastic about this idea, uh, but it was rejected flatly because of course, uh, you know, there was no way to accommodate uh, uh, even a part of former Yugoslavia within the Union state. So I think that it is more or less symbolic. It's interesting that uh, we have very, in my view, quite good economic relations uh, with Croatia, for example. We will see the Croatian foreign minister in Moscow before too long. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, Russia will be directly engaged in any kind of military confrontation uh, in, in this part of Europe. I think it's too far away. Uh, though, of course, I don't exclude some private uh, Russian individuals hired by military 
private military companies uh, if such companies operate uh, in the Balkans. But my take is that we will see more of uh, such cases in Africa rather than in Europe. Andre, thank you so much. And really sorry once again that we don't have you in house, but I can talk <laughs> now that well. we have come, uh, permanent invitation to come and to join us uh, at least for a month. Thank you very much also for all of you that have been uh, on Zoom at the end of the day. And uh, listen, we don't know what is going to happen, but we know it's not going to be boring. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Juan. It's always a pleasure uh, to be with you. And uh, hopefully next year, I'll see you in person either in Moscow or maybe in Vienna. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening.